Okay, so let me kick off, first of all, with, with Anne Connolly, the, the Policing Board Chair. If I could turn to you first. Keir talked about a lot of positive change in Northern Ireland around accountability, um, and that the board set its own tone early. What is the value of police accountability and oversight today? But more specifically, given the program of, action, the program of government's focus on societal outcomes, what benefits does society have for our community in Northern Ireland in 2016? Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think first and foremost, to set it into context, every public service gets funding from the taxpayer and as, as such is, should be open to scrutiny, however that's done. Um, when you come to the police service, not only have they access to a very large budget, albeit dwindling, but they also have the very, very significant powers which no other citizen in a uniform would have. Uh, in other words, that they can arrest people, detain them, do all of that. So it is extremely important that the police service is policed, however that's done, be it with the police and crime commissioner or with, with a board. Um, the board, I think, does work well. Uh, I think um, sometimes people believe that the board is what they see in the little R downstairs on a Thursday afternoon. But in actual fact, as most people know, there's lots of work done through committees. Uh, and there's a lot of ongoing work, but we have a model where we have 10 elected representatives and nine citizens who have been appointed through a public appointments <laughs> process. So there's a range of skill and a range of experience in terms of challenging and asking the right questions. So from the point of view of the public, uh, of which I'm also a member, uh, they can see that uh, the police are being asked difficult questions, they're being asked to um, account for why they've done something. Uh, they are also asked to bring forward plans of what they're going to do. Uh, we look at that. We have very robust conversations. Uh, sometimes we have um, a huff, would I say that? <laughs> uh, maybe not. But, uh, he's huffing, so he's not uh, going to reply. We, we, it, it works, but we have a very robust um, challenge, but we have a very good relationship. All of the board members would have a good relationship good working positive relation with the police service, but we're not uh, frightened to challenge. I think the public deserve that. I think they see that we do ask the right questions, that we do sometimes put the chief constable under pressure because we don't agree with what he has done or what he plans to do. Uh, but that gives the public confidence. And in fact, today we've just had the um, publication of the latest figures, and I know you can read into it all you like, but there's a very high level of confidence in policing from the public, which is tremendous. But there's also, thankfully, a very high level of confidence in the policing board. That wouldn't have been the case five years ago. A lot of people wouldn't have heard of it. Uh, but now through media, live streaming, all of that, people have access to all of the board minutes, uh, notes of meetings, and indeed can come in and join us as we have our public meetings. So I think it's a very open and transparent model. Mm -hmm. um, when I said about the huffing, I'm the one that huffs usually, isn't that right? But uh, it, is, it is a good relationship. We have very good board members uh, who really challenge and quiz, give a lot of time to it. I think people don't understand the amount of time and yeah. effort goes into getting it right. Um, we've had our third public meeting this month, or sorry, our third private meeting this month. Normally we have one. So we don't let things go. We really do challenge and I think that gives the public generally confidence in what we do. Thank you, Anne. And very interesting recognition that the board itself also has to be responsible in terms of how transparent it is. But so accountability going to democratic legitimacy um, and public confidence. George, I'm going to lead on from, from Anne's comments to ask you. The PSNI has been said to be one of the most accountable policing services in the world. Um, and at times over the last 15 years, certainly in discussions that I've had, um, it has been described as dysfunctional um, and also overly burdensome and bureaucratic, as well as being celebrated as leading the way as a model for police reform and accountability. From your perspective, does scrutiny and oversight help the PSNI do its job better? And 15 years on, do you think a proper balance has been struck in policing oversight in Northern Ireland? Um, well, I think the um, accountability goes right to the heart of policing with consent. It goes right to the heart of uh, 
legitimacy of the police service. Um, so I, I think if there's a cost to be paid in terms of feeding the machine and the bureaucracy around it, that's actually not a reason not to do it because it is so fundamental to our legitimacy and to public confidence in, in policing. Um, I, I suppose uh, for me there are there, there are elements of accountability. I mean, I've been really clear with senior leaders in the organisation and with myself, e even when it's uncomfortable, that you know this accountability is something that we are. It's, it's back to Keir's point about whether it's sort of reluctant acceptance or or, or a sort of a, a maximum embracing of it. That we are going to embrace this accountability, even if it is really uncomfortable at times, because it is so fundamental to our legitimacy and to confidence in policing. Um, but I think sometimes we probably need to get ourselves and the accountability machinery slightly better organized. Right. So for example, in my first 12 months as chief, we had 14 different scrutiny bodies inspect and audit us and produce reports and suites of recommendations, some of which contradicted each other. Um, yeah. And that's not me being dismissive of that. In isolation, each of those 14 pieces of work were good, but you actually do end up um, servicing that at the cost of public service delivery. So uh, that isn't a sort of a minimalist acceptance of the scrutiny. I think there's three, I, I view it in my own head, is, is sort of three main areas of accountability. One is the formal piece, which is absolutely critical. It was the foundations falling out of pattern, which is largely the policing board and the police ombudsman. Um, and uh, those formal uh, legislative accountability arrangements are good. There's also another piece of sort of formal accountability that comes from other scrutineers. So HMIC, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, the Children's Commissioner, the, uh, the Human Rights Commission, and so on. And there is real value added by that level of scrutiny. I, I tend to view that as, yes, it, it does add to the legitimacy and the consent, the, the public consent for policing, um, especially when it's done in an open and transparent way. But it, it, it's, I, I see that primarily about internally for organizational learning about platforms for improvement. And I think if you can respond to that level of scrutiny through that positive lens, then you don't need to huff. Um, so, and then- the, the I can see this is going to become a theme. The, <laughs> The, 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 third, the third strand of accountability is actually a really important one that I think is, is, is so key to real confidence, the likes of the confidence figures published this morning, um, you know, which are positive, but we're not complacent around them, is the informal accountability. I don't want district commanders waiting until to answer questions about operational activity and what they've done and why they've done it and when they did it and who was involved and what community impact assessments were done. I don't want that waiting until, you know, Michael Maguire comes and, and does an ombudsman's investigation or there's a policing board question in the public meeting on the first Thursday of every month. I want people to be responsive, to be accountable and as far as they can be, to be transparent. I mean, there are some difficult areas around accountability and uh, around uh, information and, and handling that in a way that doesn't breach the Data Protection Act and upholds uh, or balances out the rights of everybody involved, the Article 2 and Article 8 rights and, and all the rest of it. But none of that should ever be used as an excuse for not being open and not being accountable. And I think it's actually that third element of this informal accountability, which is more about a mindset and a, a, a paradigm at the sort of operational delivery level that is the bit that we still have a distance to go on because the rest of it actually is not really negotiable. It's in legislation. It's either do it, get on with it, embrace it, or find a different job. But that third element is the bit where we do have a degree of um, choice and, and it, it, it reads right into Keir's point about sort of maximum acceptance yeah. rather than a reluctant minimalist approach. And goes to that cultural point you were saying about what the institution is. So we've got the kind of formal piece on one side and we've got this personal or informal accountability responding to public concerns. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, George.
Can I move now to um, ask the, the chair of the Irish Policing Authority, Josephine? Um, the Irish Policing Authority has just been established 1st of January 2016. Um, in your statement of strategy for 2016 to 18, you suggest a new policing authority, and I quote, represents a significant depoliticisation of policing in Ireland. Can I ask you, as chair of the new authority, what you consider to be the impact of the new oversight framework in Ireland, particularly from the point of view of openness and transparency of policing? Uh, thank you, Jane. And um, I suppose just for the audience to know that the structure we have um, in the Republic is a little bit different. And so the authority is an authority of nine members who in Northern Ireland terms would all be classed as independent members. There are no political representatives um, on the authority. And that's, that was a deliberate, a deliberate policy decision uh, by, by government, hence my remarks about depoliticization. I mean, commentators have been calling for many, many years for the need to put greater distance between politics and the day-to-day -day running um, of the Irish Police Service. So from that point of view, uh, this is welcomed uh, by commentators, although, as it, I suppose, like uh, the earlier um, remarks, there are different models, and it will take a long time to know whether our model is the appropriate one or not. So to your question about impact, I suppose we think we're having an amazing impact, but then we're a little bit biased. Um, we've been extremely busy doing a lot of things. Um, a lot of our immediate impact is internal. And for example, before this week is out, we will approve the policing plan for next year uh, and send it to the minister and from there to parliament. And it will look substantially different from previous policing plans and will form a basis for us to begin to develop a better performance framework, a performance evaluation framework uh, for the guards. Um, and it, with that in mind, just by way of a remark, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon's session because we know we have a lot to learn about what are appropriate and effective, um, and effective uh, measurement and assessment systems. But we're going to give it our best shot the, this year. And it will be interesting, the plan will have been approved by a group of independent civilians for the first time. And that's, that's a real milestone um, in the depoliticization uh, piece. On the transparency and openness side, um, we made a decision at our very first meeting that we were going to put the outward facing pieces uh, on our must do priority list. And that caused some ripples in the system. Um, pleasant surprise by observers who thought we would faff around like civil servants do for months and months and months before we would actually get out there and, and, and do the outward facing pieces. And unpleasant, I think, reaction from some who might be appearing before us who thought the same, that we wouldn't be ready for absolutely ages. Um, so, for example, we did our first public consultation. One of our biggest um, jobs this year is to produce a code of ethics for the guards, and we will do that by the end of the year. And we did our first public consultation in February, having only had our first meeting as an authority on 28th of January. Uh, just to give you a sense of the pace we put into the outward pieces, um, we had our first meeting in public uh, in April. Uh, since then, we have, we've had a total of four, and the fifth one is uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we're obliged by law to have four, but we're having five at least. So those kind of pieces uh, we put in place, we had a really successful consultation day with civil society groups um, and representatives of the public, uh, which uh, um, was seriously welcomed by people who, again, who didn't think we would do that and who didn't think we would do it yet. Uh, and we've met the Joint Policing Committee chairs, which hadn't brought them together as a group and met them, which hadn't happened in 10 years. So those kind of impacts um, uh, are people who are close to policing, I think, uh, are welcomed and regarded as positive. But if you were the sort of person in the bar stool or the person in the Clapham omnibus, um, that wouldn't mean an awful lot to you. So I think among the commentariat, we have yet to achieve that kind of impact. Um, and certainly there are commentators who, who are disappointed that we are not like a monthly public accounts committee which is continually you know, negative and, and, and scratching away at, um, at the commissioner and her team. We see the meetings in public as an opportunity clearly uh, to ask questions and to challenge. And I was taken very much with your, the remarks that you quoted from yesterday's um, 
closing contributor about uh, reflection not being passive. Well, oversight isn't passive either. No. It's demanding and it's challenging. But equally, it's a shop window. It's an opportunity um, which hasn't been available to the guards in the past. Mm. What passed for public accountability up to now has been, at best, haphazard. Um, arguably, now there might, might not be full agreement on this, but arguably only taking place in the context of the latest outrage or crisis and only taking place with a tone of blame. So we've been trying to sort of be very clear that oversight isn't about blame, it's about certainly challenge, it's also about support and opportunity. And again, I was taken by Keir's remarks about the tone fr from the policing board here. And we've had our first bilateral with Anne yesterday and we're going to build on that relationship because you've got 15 years of doing this and again, we, we know we, we have a lot to learn from you. Well, can I just come in there and ask, I mean, Anne was sorry, very clear that, it, and, and it's been acknowledged that in the early years of the policing board, there were some significant challenges to overcome. People uh, and institutions that are not used to oversight to suddenly have a mechanism um, looking at them it is not a, in a comfortable place to be at the beginning. Mm. Um, obviously, we the Northern Ireland experience was through the Patton um, Commission and Reform of Policing. You have been set up in part in response to various issues around the Garda. Has that made your starting point a little bit more full of obstacles? Uh, more than Anne, no, absolutely <laughs> not. More than Northern Ireland, absolutely not. Um, but it had obstacles, no question about that. Um, at this, I mean, it was welcomed by everybody, but welcoming and then actually uh, collaborating are not quite the same thing. And so certainly um, we have had our moments and I've no doubt we'll have them again. Um, I think there wasn't a preparedness, something I've been saying in a few places, um, the policing authority has only one job to do, and that's oversight of the Garda Siakona. And I've heard uh, the commissioner's version of George's most recent speech about all those hundreds and thousands of recommendations and all those reports and all those oversight bodies. Most of those oversight bodies have other things to do. We have only one job to do. And I don't think that that was quite understood, that actually because we had only one job to do, we would do it every month. Right. And we would do it with a persistence, because that's our job. And recently, I had to appear before Parliament to account for our stewardship. And that was quite an interesting experience. So, you know, that's a piece, I think, again, that maybe is often overlooked. We've, uh, like the policing board, we've been open and transparent with all our own uh, material from day one. But we were, and I certainly was challenged on whether we were um, the subject to regulatory capture, if I might use that language. And that's a risk. So we have our own accountability, and that puts a piece um, and, uh, that we have to keep maybe reminding. Just one in terms of your first question about impact that I think might, one practical piece that we can tick off and say we did make a difference is that earlier this year, we, we called on the commissioner to publish some material that she had just been reluctant to publish for no reason that we really could understand. She, the guards carried out a very, um, a very professional a uh, public attitude survey in relation to their work. And we had it, and we'd had it for months, and we'd asked privately for it to be published. And it took us to openly, transparently call publicly for it to be published before it got published. Right. Um, and in a way, if I go back again to the, the, the uh, continuum that Care described between reluctant minimum, so that sort of, to me, is where that showed, a reluctant minimum uh, likewise, we called on the Commissioner to publish her protected disclosure policy and make it publicly available in a context of a lot of controversy about protected disclosure um, uh, in the Guards. And for some reason, there was, you know, getting them out of that reluctant minimum spot yeah. um, was difficult. So those two pieces are immediate impact where we have material in the public domain now Aidan may tell me they would have done it anyway. Perhaps they would have, but they hadn't. Okay, well, thank you very much for that and, and for very nicely um, letting me um, introduce Chief Superintendent Aidan Glacken. A, a couple of questions for you, Aidan. For, first of all, maybe just, okay, so how is Angarda Shikono um, recovering with the, um, the inauguration of a, a new policing authority in the last year? 
Um, but the second also just to bring this into policing across the island of Ireland. There, there's huge levels of collaboration now between the PSNI and Angarda Shikona. Um, joint policing arrangements for tackling a whole host of um, a wide range of criminality, cross-border crime. And I just wondered if you could also talk to us a little about those benefits of cross-border collaboration and how you think the joint policing initiatives are contributing to building public confidence in, in both um, the police services across Ireland. Thanks very much. Um, nice segue from uh, Josephine, thanks very much. But just as a way of introduction, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologise uh, on behalf of uh, Commissioner uh, O'Sullivan. Uh, we have some issues that are uh, pertinent in the South at the moment that need her uh, attendance, so I've been uh, nicely um, nominated, and I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll deal with... Um, by way of introduction, uh, my day job is I'm in charge of strategic, in, uh, strategic transformation for the Guard organisation. And in er earlier in this year, in June, we produced our modernisation and renewal programme, which sets out to modernise, reform, renew, professionalise um, the Guard organisation in, in total um, by um, increasing our numbers by across people, process, technology, structure, and addressing and dealing with culture and dealing with a long number of years uh, of, of um, constructive observation, uh, public attitude service, um, internal service that we need to address and that we will address and that we will take time to address. And there are challenges in that. And we certainly welcome the input from all of our friends, and uh, including the police authority. And I, uh, within my current role, have had a number of meetings with the police authority and we share on a continuous basis what we are doing in that area to bring about the changes and the reform and the renewal that we need to bring about. So I welcome that, and we will continue to welcome that as an organisation. And that's part of accountability, and there's no shirking from accountability. And uh, I, I really like the, um, the, the conversation around um, accountability being a minimum, because accountability should never be a minimum. Accountability should always be what we are doing. Um, firstly, we've got to be accountable to ourselves, not just accountable to oversight bodies that are having accountability forced upon you, because that's not real accountability. We ourselves, and I think the Chief Constable touched on it uh, himself about his own officers and his own senior officers not waiting for somebody to come and call and ask that question. So we internally have to be courageous, honest, um, open, and open and transparency are thrown out there. But we've got to be, as an organisation, willing to be that person and those people as police leaders. So um, I think maybe that maybe addresses one of the questions, and I'll just move on. Um, you know, there's been a recent commentary that we're in the golden era, era of cooperation. But I think um, cross-border, and certainly within Angara Shikana and PSNI, we've always had collaborative relationships. Uh, we've always had a coincidence of goals. I myself was a young police officer along the border 30 odd years ago, and I could see how local policing worked, be it the local sergeant on one side of the border or the other, they had collaborative relationships and they worked in cooperation. Although it may have been under the radar, but now we're in a different area. So partnerships are not an optional extra. Partnerships are the golden thread of policing. Um, we want to make Ireland a hostile environment for criminality. We have relationship interdependencies. Relationship interdependencies are not weaknesses. Relationship interdependencies are strengths and strengths that we can build on and we need to continue to build on. So going back to the prioritisation and the budgets and the cutting of budgets, we as an organisation working with our colleagues in the PSNI and across the other law enforcement agencies, be they customs, revenue, uh, personnel from the Departments of Agriculture, Social Protection, work with the National Crime Agency, um, you know, we need to be ahead of the curve rather than deal with the consequences. And that puts us in a better state of play to be able to deal with those priorities because the priorities are set down by our communities. Um, but, you know, what, or how do you determine the priorities? Is it, is it human trafficking? Is it finance crime? Is it illicit trading? Is it organised crime? You know, so those priorities have to be determined and the new Joint Agency Task Force has, a number, has six priorities set down. But go back to Anne's point made in her opening address, the communities need to understand what is that coordination of activities that are taking place. Um, that we're committed to dismantling uh, criminal, criminal gangs, organized criminal gangs, but that understanding has to be communicated by ourselves to each and every person out there. 
because our brand, as on Garage Chicana, are, is Guardians of the Peace, translated. So we need to, our, that's our brand. So we need to set out trust, and how do we get that trust? Trust through the cooperation of, of, of our agencies. So trust is our brand, trust is our currency, trust is our currency working with our, with our, our, our partner agencies, North and South. So trust also comes from action, and we've seen the actions, even though the Joint Agency Task Force is, is up and running a number of months, we've seen actions uh, across human trafficking, around creeper burglaries, intelligence-led oper operations uh, targeting rural crime, uh, multi-agency checkpoints involving other agencies, also working and sharing information with the, uh, the National Crime Agency targeting, targeting um, organised crime. So, activities and activities build trust. So, results uh, builds trust within, within communities. We need to spread the message of determination, not just uh, uh, how crimes are impacting on communities, but what we're going to do in the future. But we cannot do this by standing alone, and we work closely with everybody. But many of the crimes impacting on communities are, are, are planned from abroad, so we have to work with our international partners. And you may have seen recently where we had a number of uh, police officers from the Guardia Civil and the Spanish police dealing with organised crime that's occurring. And organised crime knows, knows no borders. So, you know, we've got to use the intelligence and the information to get and translate that into evidence to deal with the... The, the threats and the emerging threats, not just across our borders, but inter internationally. There is a whole ramut of expertise and knowledge, and bringing and coordinating that can bring this expertise to make our services stronger and have that impact w within, the, within the community. And we are continued and committed to doing that um, with our partners in the PSNI, but also with communities and partnerships are not just about policing and law enforcement agencies and I talked there, I mentioned earlier on, partnerships are the golden thread of policing that we will survive on and that we will all survive on. Thank you. Aidan, thank you and, and you'll see that I couldn't resist the opportunity to ask you a little bit around collaboration which we'll also be building on in the next session but thank you also for talking about your perspective of accountability. Um, so from Northern Ireland to Ireland and now um, to Great Britain um, and I'd like to um, ask the Police and Crime Commissioner David Jameson about the, the model of accountability um, there. He's the West Mid Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner. But just by way of background, as Keir commented, England and Wales has changed its model of police accountability quite radically. So police and crime commissioners replaced police authorities in England and Wales in 2012. Every police force area is now represented by a PCC, except Greater Manchester and London, <laughs> where PCC responsibilities lie with the mayor. Police and crime commissioners were elected for the second time only on the 5th of May 2016 in 40 force areas across England and Wales. So authority rests with one person. David, a couple of questions for you. First of all, how do you engage with your local community? And what do you see as the key challenges for policing today? But let me also ask you, in 2012, there were 11 out of the 40 PCCs were independently elect or were independent. In the elections in 2016, only three were independent PCCs. The remaining 37 were all political nominations. Is there a danger of this new model politicising policing in England and Wales? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jane. And, and can I say we, we're delighted uh, to be here in, in Northern Ireland at this uh, uh, conference. And uh, would, would you just permit, permit me to say as well that um, uh, I, somebody last night said they were the oldest member of the panel. I think I might have picked that banner up this morning. <laughs> um, and also, one of the differences is that, that, that I have is really quite awesome powers that were given to me by uh, Parliament uh, to make decisions uh, that are in the best interests of the area for which I am directly elected. So one of those things I have is, is a certain amount of flexibility on who I have working with me and how I operate. And my area of the West Midlands, which is just under three million people, uh, at the heart of uh, the West Midlands, of course, is Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham is about 38% of the, of the total uh, of the uh, West Midlands. And it may interest you to know that uh, in the West Midlands, uh, across all the West Midlands, but in particular Birmingham, Birmingham, half of the population now are 24 years old and younger. 
and, 24, and younger people are more likely to be perpetrators of crime and, of course, more likely to be victims of crime. One of the things I did in the flexibility that's been given me, that a flexibility that wouldn't be available uh, to a board or a panel, is to... I don't have a deputy, but I have two assistants. And one of my assistants is here today, uh, young Ashley Bertie here. Ashley, could you just stand up and say hello? There we are. I don't, I don't spare his blushes on any occasion. Um, but, but Ashley has come in to, to help me see things through a different prism, uh, because the prism of a, how a younger person... Uh, may see things, how they see how younger people are affected uh, by crime, that is actually very important to me. If later on uh, any of you have, when you're mixing around for coffee and things, you have difficulty telling the difference between Ashley and myself, if you look very carefully, you'll notice his hair is slightly shorter uh, than mine. Um, in terms Ashley's of the going to half now, or are you going to half? <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the accountability to the, to the public, You'll notice that my role is somewhat different from, say, the, the board here, because this is the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Mine, I am a police and crime commissioner, and I have a role in terms of crime and preventing crime, and I have a big role in helping victims of crime. So one of the things that I do, which is very separate from the uh, Chief Constable, uh, I use some of the money from the Ministry of Justice, over £3 million, which we distribute uh, to those people who have been victims of crime. And I've brought on board uh, people from the independent and charity sector who are actually working with me, deciding where those priorities might be. You'll be hardly surprised uh, to learn that it's mainly people who have suffered uh, domestic violence, sexual crime, and particularly women. The majority of the funding is going in those directions. But that has been recommended to me by independent people who are working alongside uh, myself. We, um, I would just argue as well, is that this is a case where I have taken over from the police authority in the West Midlands. I am now the police authority. I am a full-time person. I work day by day uh, with my chief constable. Uh, we meet uh, very frequently, uh, at least once a week. And I also have a, a small board, which I have created myself, of people who uh, represent the whole of the West Midlands geographically and ethnically, as well, and in age and, and in gender. And that small group acts, if you like, as part of like a select committee in helping me, uh, questioning the, the, the chief. And we do some of that in public as well. We do that where we webcast our, our, our sessions and they're there for all to see. And that's a way in which the public are not only seeing how the chief constable staff are being held to account, they're also seeing, they're also holding me to account because I am being seen to be doing my job or not doing my job. And in the end, people go and cast a vote. And if they don't like me, they can actually get rid of me, mm. uh, which is part of what democracy is all about. Just coming to the, uh, the, the, the second part of your, your question, the uh, Westminster government made a complete hash of how they started off with the police and crime commissioners. So what they did is the legislation was delayed by their lordships. Uh, and then, uh, because they couldn't hold the elections in May, they decided it was a good idea to hold them on a cold day in November 2012. And they were astonished the, the tsunami of indifference of the voters uh, who hadn't even been told what this role was yeah. about. No other elections were taking place. That actually was about 11% turnout in our area. That has changed. And there's now uh, a turnout in the last election when I was voted, voted in again. Uh, there was a 32-33% turnout in my area, and I gained about a third of a million votes, as one or two members of Parliament would like to have a third of a million uh, votes. So I now account directly back uh, with the mandate that's been uh, given to me. You, the final uh, part of what you're asking about is there were a number of independents uh, were successful uh, last time. I, I think the problem was that everyone was given a few weeks to get started, and really it was just chaos in 2012. The political parties weren't ready. Even the government's own party, the Conservative Party, were not geared up and ready. What has happened since is that the, I, 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 my colleagues and myself, the, the Labour PCCs, although 16 of us out of the 43, we're covering two-thirds of the policing in England and Wales. So we tend to be the bigger authorities, the metropolitan uh, areas. Uh, because 
the type of people who come in, people like myself, a former member of parliament and, and government minister, so are many of the other uh, Labour members as well. We have tended to take the lead, on a, I think on a cross-party basis, we've taken the lead in a lot of the thinking that's going on. The independents uh, came in, some of them were very good, but some of them didn't have that background in public service and the understanding of what accountability is back, being a, a publicly elected person, didn't have that understanding. And some of them found that very difficult. I've been in tw 23 years in elected office and have a pretty good idea what it's like to, to have to meet and deal with the electorate and how you account to people. So that's what's happened. The, the other thing is as well, because the, the electorate is huge, I've got 1.9 million voters in my area. And you imagine once the election's declared, you've just got a matter of 10, week, 10 days before the postal votes go out. So you really have got very little time to crack on. And if, for an independent to cope with, that's very difficult. But an independent that could might be a wealthy millionaire who wants the job for their own purposes. That's the weakness of it. And that's why in political parties, at least I have to go through the grist of being selected by my party and have to face the sort of um, the, the selection process internally. So my party has to make sure I'm fit to go forward uh, to do the job. Who knows, they may change their mind one day. But thank you. Thank you very much. So we have the, the danger of independence and wealthy millionaires pursuing their own agenda. I suppose on the other side, we also have the danger of political parties also pursuing their own agendas too. So without further, without further remarks from me, West Midlands Chief Constable Dave Thompson, just by way of maybe response and building on, on those comments by, by your Police and Crime Commissioner, you've heard a lot about the different types of um, police oversight structures. Um, in Northern Ireland, in Ireland, um, and the changing ones. Maybe you could reflect on your experiences both in terms of the police authorities and also the police and crime commissioners, but perhaps also contextualise this in an era of austerity. Um, and perhaps if I could also ask you, Keir made the point that in any large organisation, mistakes are inevitable, and it's how we respond to those mistakes. So how, how do you address the, the glitches that have to be addressed with your police and crime commissioner, your oversight model? So thank you for, uh, for inviting me. As, as David said, it's been good to come here and share. Um, for the person who also has a piece of Christian raincoat, I've enjoyed you sharing my coat, uh, and uh, I brought <laughs> yours back if you'd like to exchange them today. Uh, <laughs> the, right, so... Perhaps we'll talk about austerity first, then we'll talk about the sort of governance issues. Uh, so uh, today, if you see in the news, HMIC has just done a publication of its Peel's efficiency inspections on how efficient forces are. West Midlands Police is one of two forces that's been graded as an outstanding, and we have had to be outstanding on austerity, uh, because as David says, we police Europe's youngest city. 30% of the people are for black and ethnic minority communities. We have big challenges with serious crime. One of the most, we're the most urbanised place outside of London. Um, and uh, we've also got one of the biggest challenges around uh, counter-terrorism policing. And our budget's been cut by 22% in five years. I have 2,000 less officers than I did in 2010, which is an enormous reduction. It is the biggest budget reduction of any police force in the country. Um, and, and so I guess what I'd say about the, uh, you know, what well, kind of how do you respond to that? Um, well, well, of course, you know, with the police authority and the police commissioners, you look at public priorities. Um, but, of course, the job, not just of the authority, but politicians to shape public expectations, not just respond. So the debate, again, you're having about changing policing is just as important for us. Um, but there's only really three things you can do. You can reduce the amount of work you have to do. So George's point and others, prevention being at the forefront now is so important because we would like to do less policing. Less policing means we can, don't have to spend quite as much um, time and effort on that. You can change the way you do it, the method, people, your technology, your buildings, how you organise yourself. And you can change the service level. To what standard do you do it? We've done very little changes in service level, actually. We've done a lot about how we do it. But actually, a surprising amount of what we deliver to the public is what we think they want. And sometimes they don't always put quite the same value on it we might do. So understanding what people want from us is very important. The, the, one thi the one thing I don't think you do in that austerity climate is you kind of push the public out and create a list of things you don't do for them. Um, our, 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 uh, our mission statement as a force is preventing crime, protecting the public, and helping those in need. 
and actually we will step outside the boundaries of policing if somebody needs help. Uh, and what we don't do is create a catalogue of what we don't do. I think that's incredibly important for public services, particularly as we're going through austerity where many are retrenching in my view. Um, but of course there's a price to that and again it was interesting yesterday to talk about the mental and physical well-being of staff. If I say there's been a price for austerity, I don't think the public's paid that. Um, in some ways, I think actually the consequence has been on our own staff and kind of five years, we often perhaps started and saw that as a five year period to get through. It's an enduring period and we're going to have to think about how we care for our people through that. Uh, right, so police commissioners and police authorities, what's the difference feel like? So I, I've kind of worked with both. Um, so the, the old setup in England and Wales was government set a lot of the priorities. The police authority localised some of those. Uh, but it was a more scrutiny model, and in my view, the professional voice, the, the, the authority delegated the running of the force to the chief, the professional voice then came to the table and said how policing would operate more strongly, and was then scrutinised. I think the change now, and David's talked about, he, he has the um, second highest personal mandate um, after Sadiq Khan. He comes with the public mandate, comes with some areas, um, the difference now is there is a combination between how policing thinks policing should be done and the mandate the commissioner brings in terms of public priority. And, and, and I think that directional voice is now stronger with commissioners. The operational independence is no less degraded, in my view, in terms of the balance. Um, there is, uh, in terms of decision-making about direction... In some ways, that has become easier than with an authority. And the challenge with an authority, it brings so much of a spread, but actually on occasions, on directions, and, and we certainly found this in the early phase of austerity, being asked by an authority, kind of, how are you going to save some money? And we kind of agree we're going to have to do it around police stations, and we come with a plan, and then our own authority attacks us to say, well, why have you, why, why have you cut, closing all these police stations? You know, well, actually, that, that, that can't be... Uh, right way. And I'm not saying that that's what operates here. And, and indeed, your circumstances in a post-conflict environment are very different than where we are. I, I think a lot of the issues that led to police and crime commissioners were about a democratic deficit. And as a devolved administration, you know, your, your devolved administration is so much closer to the public than national government is in England and Wales. And so the kind of mayor piece, the PCC piece, has been as much about democrat democratic deficit as it has been about policing. Um, the only other thing I would say is that, that, that one of the advantages, I think, for policing of the commissioner model is that uh, David's role is broader than just the police. So the and crime, the commissioning of local authority community safety budgets, I, I feel is far more connected now to what policing is trying to achieve. The mandate allows reach into other agencies in a way that I can't as Chief Constable, and it allows a voice on policing to shape the public view in a way that I can't do as a Chief Constable as well. So w w you can all see the challenges and issues around it. Uh, it is a, a much more of a one-on-one -on -one accountability. Um, there are some advantages around it um, in terms of how it operates. Um, that there are some risks, and I think, as Keir said, you know, when when things don't work, they can be kind of quite a, a, a quite a, a big seismic failing. Um, but but that isn't just a challenge to the police. Uh, I think my view is when it fails, it fails uh, for both parties. And if you if you look at the policing protocol that regulates us, the the most important statement it says is. Uh, to make the relationship work, um, both parties have to respect their position and have a, a commitment to work in the interest of the public. And I, and I actually think that is the most important thing in the model. Okay. Dave, thank you. And thank you for perhaps for also broadening it out because I'd like to just come back to Keir, who I'm very glad is now sitting back on stage um, with us. And uh, Keir, we've talked in terms of oversight around democratic legitimacy, around consensual policing. Um, but also the very important role of accountability in terms of making sure that we're delivering effectively for victims. Um, so can I perhaps just broaden this and say, yes, we, we are aware of policing reform and openness and accountability. Can the same be said, do you think, of the wider criminal justice system? You moved the CPS towards greater transparency and very particularly emphasised the importance of recognising the needs of victims within the criminal justice system. Um, recently, the Chad Evans case has once more opened up the justice system to scrutiny about how it treats victims. So just what more would you say needs to be done to build, 
public confidence? And, and how do we improve collaboration between the different elements of the criminal justice system? Uh, thank you, Jane. And uh, can I apologise for, for, uh, to the panellists and to you for, for leaving the room? For those of you that didn't obey Jane's instructions to turn your phones off, uh, you'll know the government's just lost its Article 50 case um, on invoking the exit procedure for Brexit. So um, that's obviously a very, very big story that's breaking out there. My, that my programme for the day has changed considerably. But So no discourtesy um, as I'm trying to draft a response. Um, uh, I, I think this question is really, I mean, whenever um, we talk about criminal justice, um, we walk into a familiar um, problem, and that is that um, pretty well each of the players in the criminal justice system, whether it's the police, whether it's the prosecution, or whether it's the courts or probation, will usually say, we do a pretty good job, it's the others that are letting everybody else down. Um, and I've experienced this um, over the years. Um, and actually getting all of those involved in criminal justice to accept a joint responsibility for the way criminal justice is delivered is really, really important, but difficult um, to achieve. Um, I think that um, what's been said this morning about the buy-in um, to um, accountability in all of the um, parts of the criminal justice system is really important, um, that all parts buy into that scrutiny, and then there needs to be overarching accountability. Um, and that's uncomfortable for all of us because we have to sit around the same, same table and be accountable. And it's particularly unco uh, uh, uncomfortable for the courts um, that don't um, have the level of scrutiny and accountability that um, the other um, parts of the criminal justice system have. But we have to change the way things work. And Jane mentioned the work that I did on victims. Um, and in a sense, that comes from the whole discussion about the police service. What's the police service for? It's for the public, of course. Um, but there's a subset within the public victims who particularly rely um, on the police to get it um, right. And one of the biggest problems we had in adjusting the approach for victims was that whenever you get to criminal justice, people are so steeped in history that they really don't want to change anything. Say, so, well, this criminal justice system has been the same for 200 years. We've always had this adversarial way of doing it. We've always done it this way. Um, and all right, it doesn't work very well for victims, but we, we've had it for so long we can't change it. And just getting people to sort of hold the whole thing up to the light and be prepared to ask searching questions, I think, is, is a critical part of the whole um, exercise. And, and, and that, that has to be done, I think, collectively. So thank you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you, Keir. OK, so we have about five, ten minutes, um, and then we'll break for coffee. Um, and I'd just like to open to the floor at this stage to see if people have comments or questions. We've obviously talked about a number of different accountability models, and there seem to be positive minuses um, and justifications for each. So I just want to open it up to thoughts or um, comments from the floor, if you have any. I can hear, you can hear the coffee. Okay, well, if there is, and I wanted to make sure we were democratically inviting you, just some of the key, some of the key themes for me, I think, is the continually questioning ourselves, are we reluctantly doing the minimum or willingly doing the maximum? Where does um, getting frustrated with the bureaucracy um, fit into that? But also the need to make sure that accountability mechanisms are not overly rigid or bureaucratic. So if we do have contradicting recommendations and, and proposals, that, that creates a, a problem and also potentially undermines the very legitimacy we're trying to um, improve upon um, and to take forward. A lot of the comments that we've discussed this morning, I think, move very neatly into when we're kind of looking more broadly now at collaboration and working across the public service. So I think we'll build on those um, threads and themes um, as we go through the course of the today.